So tonight's about casting and how you can get the best work out of your actors because um, I'm an actor, Kathy's an actor, a lot of these people that join this scope are actors and we all know how uptight you might or wound up tight you are when you go into an audition room and there's nothing worse as an actor than to have the audition room feel cold we all know what that is it's like they're just they're running behind they're stressed out themselves as casting directors they've got the situation is a uh, high stress for them <laughs> especially in commercial auditions whenever you do commercial auditions it's just like forget about it I mean these guys are under an immense amount of stress and anything you can do <laughs> to put the casting director at ease usually helps you get a call back. Um, so one of the things that I did when I went to go cast my films was um, there's a couple different ways that I want to talk about this. First of all, like how do you put out a casting notice? Now you can either cast it yourself or you can hire a casting director. Of course, if you hire a casting director, it's going to cost you some money um, unless you can negotiate something out. But you know, they're in a business and that's what they do. And using a casting director is very effective because casting directors have all sorts of actors that they work with all the time and they have A-list actors and B-list actors and C-list actors that they can get a hold of. And, and anytime you can get um, somebody with a name in your film, it's obviously going to help you with financing. It's obviously going to help you with distribution. Kathy knows about that. She's had name actors in her films. I've worked with a lot of name actors in theater. And when I was producing on the other side, I also, um, that we did that. We did a lot of, I worked with um, quite a few actors that had been big at one time in their career and were, were working, but in a different capacity. But it helped us to have those like B, now B-list actors in our um, stage productions because it made it, um, that people wanted to come see them. That's it. Um, somebody saying, "Man, I'm an anthropology major, so I'm really changing gears here." So thank you. Very interesting. Fantastic. I'm so glad that this is this is helpful in some way. So you can either go through a casting director, is my point, and or you can cast it yourself because you have no money. That's how I did it. Now I'm trying to get I'm getting I'm working on getting a casting director um, who I just adore to help me because um, I'm on the East Coast. Um, uh, that has cast me in a couple of projects so I'm, I'm I, I, I love her and if I can get money that's who I'm going to use is uh, Brett Goldstein who I just adore um, and particularly for a project that I'm going to be working on next I needed some I need actors that are extremely good at improvisation but not improv to get a laugh improv that are really dead real improvers and she just cast a whole series like that so Okay, so my point is, if you're not doing a casting director and you're doing it yourself, there's de several different ways to release breakdowns. Um, but the main one that all actors are obviously on is Actors Access, ActorsAccess.com. And if you get, um, if you're a producer, you can get an account. You get an account there, and you can put down, you can put out a casting call that has a description of the characters that you are looking for. Now the thing is with the, those descriptions, it really is very helpful. You have to have an age range, okay? So you usually put in an age range and you put some kind of dilemma that that character maybe is having or physical attributes, you know, either their problem, okay? Or their problem and what their what, what the physical attributes are that you are looking for when you um, put, put the breakdown out on Actors Access. And then people will submit to you um, their what you know how they feel if they feel they're right for the roles this is where this is where the rubber meets the road people because when people submit yes a character description thank you so thank you hey there's Bonnie Gillespie just entered the room and if, if you talk about casting directors brilliant casting directors Bonnie Gillespie is a brilliant casting director and also talks about um, casting and actors and how actors um, can come in with um, um, a way that at ease in the room because they are holding their own power. She has a whole book called Self-Management for Actors that is brilliant. And if there's any actors in the room, boy, read the book. It's going to help you so much. Please follow Bonnie Gillespie. She will change your life as an actor. So you are very welcome. You are very welcome, of course. So um, my point is when, when you get these, don't put your breakdowns on Craigslist. Don't put your actor breakdowns on Craigslist. Don't put them on Mandy.com. Actors Access is the one everybody is going to. Okay, a, a, any actor that is on Craigslist doesn't know the business, and they're not. I want to get it for my brother. What is it again? It's called Actors. Watch. I'm gonna write this down. 
and I'm going to put a okay so I'm going to write something down for you to uh, oh what are you talking about was the book self management for actors is the name of the book hold on it's like it's usually within my arms reach here but it's called self management for actors that yeah that's the Gillespie book and um, and Bonnie's in here. You can see her. So you want to um, click the following her, following her, and the website to put out your. Um, it's called my handwriting is just crap. Actorsaccess.com. That's where you put your breakdowns. Okay, and this is where you're going to find out who it's in her Periscope bio as well. Okay. So this is where the rubber meets the road. When these people respond to you, the, the key to auditions is bringing in the right people. Oh, I'm glad Ed, um, Badinelli grabbed it. Thank, thank you. Not Badalini. <laughs> I remember that from last night. Okay, so um, when people start to submit to you, okay, for instance, this is something that just really irked me, okay? I was looking for a black cop, a black male cop. I gave very, very specific parameters of the age range, and the fact that it needed to be a male, okay? So this this should be, okay, 300 people submitted for this role, right? But the problem was, like 60 to 70 of these people were women. And what does that say to me? Okay, what kind of idiot didn't read the breakdown to begin with? So now you've irritated me because it's bad enough I have, you know, 300 people to go through, but now 60 to 65 women just didn't read this breakdown enough to know um, <clears throat> that, I'm not I'm not considering a woman I if I wanted a woman I would have said you know either fa male and female so she's saying sure in case you go another way that's what the actor is thinking in their mind and listen I used to be that actor and I'm gonna tell you a horror story tonight if you wait to the end I'll tell you my acting horror story my personal what I did the bad the bad girl that learned the hard way okay okay so they're thinking oh she may make up her mind she may be doing something else oh good keep working on that commercial breaks man Keep doing it. Put yourself up on Actors Access. I know there's nothing better than horror stories, and I've got them all, man. Okay, so once you are going, when I'm going through that, I am looking for very specific parameters. And by the way, I stated on there that they had to be five foot ten and above. Now, people with five foot six, blah blah blah, they all submitted. And the thing is, is that I needed that cop to be taller than me. So I was absolutely looking for. I was looking for very specifics. So please don't submit yourself for stuff you're not right for if you're an actor, because you know what? They know what they want. Okay? Yeah. Keep thinking that and not working. That's exactly it. Keep thinking you're. They're gonna think some other way, <laughs> which is really gonna be brilliant. Let me remind me to tell you the Lion King story. Okay? Before we get to the end of this whole night. Okay, so there I am wading through all this stuff. Now, now once I get, I, I just need, your, your key as a producer or director is to call in the right people to begin with. Don't call in a huge amount of people that keep thinking that way and keep working. Well, you know what? Cast yourself then. Cast yourself. If, you, if you're going to submit to roles that you're not right for, just go off and write your own role and produce your own thing because you can't you just absolutely don't irritate the producer that could hire you later you know don't do that because it doesn't help you you know you can work as hard as you you can work you can be like you know a gerbil running around a cage Stallone says he's 5'10 he's barely 5'7 but what did Stallone do Stallone created his own movie which he shot to over 900 people that, that turned him down and he finally got it made himself okay so it doesn't matter if he's five foot seven or five foot ten yes that he wrote by the way okay so he did self-produce he is the ultimate person yes he created his own content something that he could control is what Bonnie Gillespie is saying boy I'm really on a high horse tonight about this but the truth of the matter is yes Stallone wrote it Stallone wrote Rocky Okay, and he shopped that forever, by the way, and got turned down by the best of the best, and then finally got it made, and then look, so you know what? He's earned the right to call himself 5'10 right now. Who gives a crap? Because he can cast himself in his own films. Enough said. Okay, so when, just respect those rules, then as the producer, though, it's your job not to bring in the wrong people, too, because you're just going to be wasting your time, and by the way, irritating the other actors who are out there in the room, too. 
lots of want, wanted to make it, but he held off with the one that would make it with him. Exactly, because he wanted to play that role, and a lot of people were willing to buy it, but yeah. Okay, so that's Stallone, but we're going to move on to us. We have our own piece of work, right? We have our own piece of work right now. We want to produce it. Getting the best cast means being specific in that breakdown and not bringing in a hundred people to look at, but really looking through because you're going to see, you know, for me, it was important that the person had some kind of experience, um, you know, as an actor um, on a set. I didn't want to waste the time with people that really didn't have that kind of experience at the time. Um, I just I did, couldn't take a chance because I was also working with kids, like a lot of kids, like five lead kids. So the last thing I needed to worry about were the adults in this production. Okay, so I needed people with experience and people that are going to be had had that on their resume. So I shortened my list. I think I looked at twenty. Out of the 300 that submitted, I brought in 20. I called back six. The thing that you can do to really set this up so that people really think that you are a pro um, when you're, you know, and that it's going to show how professional you are is to get a real space to audition it in. Like, for instance, for, for me, I got a space at Ripley Greer, which is one of the big, you know, the studio rehearsal places in New York that everybody knows how to get there. I think I used Simple Studios at one point, too. These are reputable spaces. You can get them for a deal. You just sign up for um, having an account there. It's not that expensive to get it for a couple hours. For the room size that I needed, I think I paid $18 an hour. I think I paid $18 an hour. So please, this is not that expensive for you to take a couple hours, rent that space, have a good camera because you're going to need a camera right on a tripod. I live just outside of New York City right now. I, I, I um, had a place in New York City, but I let it go because I'm, you know, have a family thing going out here in Jersey. So we um, got the space. She says that's when you have to be suspicious of someone casting out of a residence. That's exactly it. You you have to look afford a dang room. Listen, if you want people to treat you like a professional and come to your set and act like a professional, then be a professional, right? Get a space. She said, Phyllis has done auditions in a library. You know what, though? Some libraries actually have um, rooms that you can rent. Like our, our library here, um, that, which is a very, very large one, does have a room that you can, as long as you pre-assign it ahead of time, you can do that. And that's actually not a bad option. Like if I was holding auditions in Jersey, but I'm always, she says there's rehearsal space for musicians and libraries. Absolutely. So that's an option that you could get for free. Absolutely, that's a way to do it for free if you're looking for a free way to audition people. For me, I know that I'm going to be looking for actors out of the city, not just actors that are um, in, in, in fact, I wasn't looking in Jersey really because I already had kids that were from Jersey that were in the production, but I was looking for the adults out of the city. And everybody that lives in Jersey goes into the city to audition there anyway. So I have to make my location easy for my actors to get to. Don't put it in some place that's obscure or difficult to get to. Like today, we had to go downtown. I mean, there's a lot of casting directors now in downtown um, Manhattan. I think the space is cheaper there right now. But um, it's, it's kind of, you know, I'm always like, God, really? Downtown? All the way downtown? What a pain in the butt. You know, for actors, if you want to get them there, get them there easy so that they're not going to be late to your call. It's not about being nice to the actors in that instance. It's about making it convenient so that they're going to be there, they're going to be on time, trains aren't going to be a problem, whatever. So make it convenient for them, make it safe, right? And all that. Then, my, my smoker was <laughs> and <laughs> I'm allergic to smoke, but I love that smoking thing. Okay, so you get then you have to make sure that you allow enough time between each person because for instance I needed now normally in an audition situation you know you're gonna see it like every five minutes yeah, I'm the head of the studio with that bit right okay listen to me Goldwyn says Goldwyn says okay so you have to allow enough time between each audition when I go to auditions there's usually like a five minute thing between each people's auditions I knew however that I was gonna be doing improvisation with those actors because I needed to know See, that's kind of a test of an actor to me, is when um, it's one thing if they've decided what they're going to do with their character, um, and and they've memorized it, and they've kind of memorized it within the lines, 
but I, for a test of an actor, for me, I want to see if they can improv in character. Like I've given them this character. They've seen the character. They've got the breakdown. Now I want to see kind of a little more like, can they live in that character for a little bit? So I knew I was going to allow time for improvisation. So I booked 15 minutes between each person. Because I didn't want any one actor to feel like they were sitting out in that other room waiting because I am an actor and I get irritated when I have to wait. So I made sure that I booked enough time. So that's one of the things you're going to want to do is book enough time in between each person. I think uh, it's a big mistake of first time filmmakers that they think they can whip through these people in, in five minutes and just don't do that the first time so that you can kind of start to measure you know how much chatter you do with them and then um, wh whatever it, your process is everybody's process is different so just book enough time um, in between and also don't give them a huge amount of material to start out with because let's say that they're going to be in 20 pages of your script okay fine don't book too much material because especially for that first for that first um, read you're gonna find out oh I called in let's say 40 people for this role but like 20 of them just couldn't even act I mean sometimes that happens they just can't act and so why would you sit there painfully going through five pages of material with these people that you could have you know in the first 30 seconds of walking in the room actually you could tell they couldn't act so within the first you know page two pages you're gonna know whether or not that person is right or not right for that role save the more material or whatever you really, you know, am solidly going to have to see for the callbacks. And then you have to book the room again for callbacks. If you're really, um, this is the other thing I found out this, this last time of doing auditions is then the other thing that the rubber hits the road is when people start saying, cause you should always listen to the first audition, the breakdown when you're doing the first call and then when the callbacks are. And if people are not available for that callback, they shouldn't have come to the audition in the first place because you don't have time. Yeah, you know, in one page, Kathy's like, you know, in one page. Absolutely. Because, you know, you when you're looking at their headshots and their resumes, you're not hearing their voice. And sometimes now I did take the time to look at people's reels if they had it on there. That was the other thing that made me cut somebody from consideration or keep somebody. Cause, you know maybe they're a big burly guy but they got a voice like this or whatever you know obviously if it's a comedy it's terrific you know but if <laughs> that's not what you want that's plus if their reel is showing that all they've done is stuff that is the, I mean the production values are just so hideous that you can't you know and it's hard to concentrate on that person for me I need somebody with more experience than that for that particular role some things, maybe if it's like one or two line, I'm, I'm going to be willing to, you know, look by the production values on the reel, but make your, if you're an actor out there, make sure your reel looks decent because it, it's kind of a judge of how professional you look to this. I have a question. It's kind of long. Okay. Shoot. Is it directly related to acting? Go ahead and put it up and we'll find out whether or not it, it could be answered here tonight or whether or not it should be a future like a future conversation deal. Okay, so making sure that everything, everybody feels really comfortable in the room is one, you've allowed enough time, nobody's running late, those actors feel like, okay, this is great. Then when they come in, say hi. Don't just be like, let's go. You know, what do you got for me? Um, you know, you have to war kind of, if, if, the, if the actor looks totally uncomfortable, and they look really, really nervous. Just tell them how excited they are. You know, you are that they came today. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions of us as actors? You know, as um, producers or directors, or any question about the project? And for sure, you're always going to ask them. Do you have any questions regarding the material? Like, if they have a question about it, let them ask it. This is also very interesting because you're going to find out from some actors that they'll just start talking to talk because they think they're supposed to answer that question. <laughs> Versus whether or not they really have a real question about the character, like either plot line or their motivation, or, you know, okay, for instance, the, the old Law and Order editor, did I kill him? <laughs> you know, these things. Bonnie, my do you have any questions is both, <laughs> yes, do you have any questions is both an asshole filter and that's exactly ready, set, audition. Exactly. Because 
and I, I did, you know, I did a Law and Order, and I've auditioned for Law and Order, and there are a lot of times that you do walk in the room and go, "Did I do it?" <laughs> Sometimes they'll say, "Hey, just go with what you." <laughs> Let's see what you got, and we'll find out if it's right or not. Okay, so it is. It is really a, a bullshit. That's where you find out whether or not they're full of shit. The actor, like if they just start going off in a whole direction that is like, what? That's when the cray cray signal goes off and you go, mm, I don't have it. She says, at this point in the script, we don't know. Yes. Lots of times um, people will say, uh, I, I have no idea what's going on in the script here. And sometimes you don't actually know the answer to the question. You know, sometimes, the, so you'll just say, make an interest, you know, let's see what you got. Make an interesting choice. By the way, an interesting choice. I always, she says, maybe you're the bad guy now, but it hasn't been revealed. Exactly. You know, don't limit those actors' choices before they start talking because you don't know what they have um, in store for you that might be exciting. Yes, or they're in rewrites tonight, Bonnie is saying. My brother can act like Heath Ledger's Joker very well. He's amazing. Okay. Okay, that's terrific about your brother, but what's the point? <laughs> Versatile, though. Is that going to hurt him? No, Versatile isn't going to hurt. Versatile is terrific. But the thing is, is that let's say... I'm asking for an actor to be, um, to have a dynamic with some, oh, he's not versatile. Listen, if he's got his bullseye and his brand and he plays it brilliantly, go out there and, and, um, no, don't, don't apologize. He's not versatile. If, if, if that's the one thing that he does and he's really, really good at, go out and book those roles, man. Go find out where you can be the badass and, and book those roles and then go to acting class and become more versatile. Because some people can be, like, brilliant at one thing that they do, but they can't take direction. And that's why I always do the improvisation, because that's when I'm going to find out whether or not they can take direction. But I usually take, okay, let's say that they have um, a scene, and they play it one way, and let's say it's just very one note. We'll call one note, which is very superficial. They've decided that the guy's an asshole, and they play him like an asshole. Um, Periscope is being quirky. Oh, sorry. He did a couple HB studio courses. Yeah, keep on it. Keep on it. If he wants to get to be more versatile, then take more actor training, not just a couple studio classes. Get in a solid year program at a reputable place and keep training. And listen, I keep training. I've been doing this since I was 19, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Okay, I always say it's, well, I used to say, I'm older than Joan Rivers. I've just had more work done. I can't say it anymore. <laughs> so, um, so my point is, you know, then if they give me one note read, I'll ask them to do it in a different way. She says, the more you do, the better you get. That's Kathy's point exactly. So let's say he starts going to play a bunch of badasses. He's going to get on a set and he's going to, or even a, a stage, he could do this on stage as well. He's going to meet other actors that are going to inspire him and that he's going to learn from. I Listen, one of my best friends who's like a, you know, a fancy actor, um, his training was he just started on stage when he was very, very, very young. And um, that was his training. He never went to school school because his, his school was being on those stages with amazing actors from all over the world. Huge. Does, tons of community theater. <laughs> trying to get him to stop. Well, you know... He, I, well, there's nothing wrong with community theater if he likes it. You know, if he wants to make the next tier up, please buy him The Self-Management for Actors by Bonnie Gillespie, and he will understand how he can make the next tier jump. That is a great book for understanding how to make a tier jump as an actor. That's the solution to that. Okay, good. Get it. You can get it on Amazon. Okay, it'll come to your free shipping. All that great stuff. Okay, so... Um, then if you give them a different direction, like let's say somebody comes in and they just play it and they're yelling and they're screaming, um, you would just say, listen, um, and, and giving a direction, by the way, as an act, this is something that I do find a little irritating is people that come out of film school right away and they're brilliant directors because they've technically learned how to direct, but they haven't ever worked with actors before. Saying to an actor, you can't just say to an actor, can you be more sad? Can you be more happy? Can you do that? you know, in, 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 in naming an emotion because an actor's process is this. An actor's process is about thinking. It's a thinking process. So if you're, if they're not thinking as the character should be thinking, give them a direction about what the character might be thinking instead. 
And then you're going to know whether or not they have a process by which they can change up what they were doing and they can give you something different. And if they don't, and if they can't make those adaptations, then um, then you know that you're not going to have somebody who can follow direction on set. And that's going to that's going to eliminate that person as well. So sometimes, you know, uh, you'll 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 hear from a casting director or whatever. Can you can you just speed that up? Because sometimes just speeding things up really does take care of a problem. People just put pauses in that. <laughs> trains could run through it because they're doing too much thinking and they're not just saying the line like a person would really say the line. So um, trying to get somebody to make those um, those changes and if you can see that they can take that direction, then you know you're going to want to bring that person for callback. And the only thing that I would say that is really your job on the other side of the table to get the most out of the actor is, is to be kind. Like, treat them as you would like to be treated so that they feel safe in that room. Because remember that what actors are doing is an extremely vulnerable process. And I think people tend to think that actors are just egomaniacs or, or have um, stardom in their eyes, right? That that's what they want is to be a star or, or that they're, they're self-centered. And these things are n not what trained a great book is directing actors by judith weston yes that's supposed to be that's a that is a really really good book but the truth of the matter is you're asking somebody to come in the room and basically if you think of acting as not putting a mask on but taking the mask off you're asking for them to walk in a person's feet at that character's foot feet um and their their journey and do that in a completely naked manner and i don't mean physically with clothing and you know what I mean their soul is they're bearing their soul for you so anything you can do in that room to make that actor feel completely safe to do that by being kind to them by breathing with them by having either an excellent reader if you're if you're not the reader yourself having an excellent reader who's also very you know simpatico um, and if they actor does something yes they're emotionally vulnerable so you have to you have to create an environment in that room that makes them able to be emotionally environmental. And that's that's going for comedy as well as drama, you know? Because for me, for the comedy, I was asking people to be, people who maybe may not be extremely experienced at, at improvisation. It's all about that wig snatching. <laughs> yeah, taking the wig off, right? Yeah, that if, um, if, if I create an environment where they feel free to play, I'm going to see what they're absolutely capable of. But if I immediately, when an actor comes in the room and I'm like, okay, what do you got? And I'm like that? Who wants to open up in front of somebody like that? Now that doesn't mean, you know, you, you're all huggy and kissy and, you know, can I get your phone number? It just means creating, you know, think of yourself as being a mother. You know? Think of that as being somebody who's don't treat them patronizingly like a child, but think of that warm environment that you have to create for that actor. And that includes you being on time and allowing enough time and space in between each actor that's going to audition. Make it a safe place. That's exactly it. Now, then it, Phyllis is saying it makes all the difference in the world to work with a director who actually likes actors. Yes, and you can feel it when you walk in the room and they... You know what? It, you, it, I would love to do a sitcom and make people laugh and feel good. Oh, good, good. Then you want to do. Then you probably want to do comedy. Um, you can feel it when somebody walks in the room and they are totally uncomfortable. So anything you can do to just say, "Hey, don't worry about it," or they or actors that start apologizing all over the place, which usually means to me that they're not. They need some more work. But if if they're always like, oh, I don't have my lines off. Oh, I don't have this. I, remember, they're probably going to be that way on set. So is that the person you're going to want to cast? No. You're going to want to cast the person that walks the room and probably has someplace better to go after they leave. <laughs> or at least they give you that impression. You know, that when they walk in the room, they're in there to play, have fun, and they've got a great picnic in Central Park they're going to next. Or whatever. And, and that they aren't sitting there with yes they can come in they can be vulnerable Bonnie says they're at their best before they have the job that's exactly it or I just got my sides bullshit well I already know 
they got their sides if I sent them to them. They got their sides because I asked for a confirmation that they got their sides. But I'm very anal retentive that way. Where because I because I am an actor, I understand and I am worried. Did they really get their sides? And it also says to me that if I know that they got their sides, that they should be off book when they walked in that room. You know, and I understand people can look down and look, you know, if they get nervous, it becomes a totally different thing in the room. And I don't care if you look down here and there or whatever, but if, if it's clear you really didn't do anything to memorize it, I don't want that person on my set. That's it. I don't want them on my set. I can't afford it. What if I rewrite something? I kind of know they got to be able to do it. You know, what if I do rewrites? I rewrote on Thanksgiving. I rewrote my entire, we shot the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and on Thanksgiving, I ended up writing a character out. So I rewrote a bunch of stuff and I had to hand those sides to my actors that morning and say, guess what? We got some new sides today. So I needed, you know, without even knowing it, I, I, pref me, right, I, I, as an actor, you know, this is weird. I kind of prefer to do comedy. I keep getting hired to be dramatic doctors. I don't know why, but, um, well, I know why. Okay. But <laughs> comedy is, is okay. In Canada, Toronto specifically, sides are expected to be memorized. Same as LA. Well, people, here's the thing. Um, different casting directors. Oh, you just bought the Ed bought your book. That's fabulous. I'd say 90, 98% of those cast directors are asking for it. They, the thing is, is that here's here's the, here's the problem. Okay, yes, you should have them memorized, and I'll tell you why. Here's my script. You're my camera. I'm looking down here. Where can you tell who the character is? If I'm kind of coming down here and going like this, can you see my eyes? You can't see my eyes. Okay. And if I'm reading the lines off the page like this, and you can't see my eyes. You don't know what's going on in my head. And remember I talked about acting being a thinking process. Acting is a thinking process. You see the thinking happen when you can see their eyeballs. You can see it and they don't do direct address. They do it to the side of the camera, right? But that you can see my eyes. So the minute my eyes are constantly down, you, I'm, you are missing the windows to my soul. And these are the windows to my soul. So. You can go ahead and not memorize it, but you're probably not going to stand as good a chance as somebody else who memorized it. Kathy, it's so much easier to play when you're memorized than when you're reading off the page. That's exactly it. Because something's going to happen in the moment, if there's a safe room environment <laughs> created, where that actor is going to feel free to do something maybe that never occurred to them before because they heard it out of the reader in some way they didn't expect to hear it out of the reader before. And... If all of a sudden that actor is shocked at something that's said and they are natural in their reaction and they are in the moment, now you've lost that beat because you have to go back to look at your line. Does this make sense? And this is all about how are we creating an environment that that actor can feel free to play. Oh, thank you, about the nails. But the actor can feel free to play so, you know, if, if you're wondering whether or not, like, if this is your film, she's saying, if you're memorized, we can actually see the interpretation of your character. Yes, because if you're too busy doing this, I can't see what's going on in here. I can't see the interpretation of the character that you made. I say this to my seven-year-old all the time, because sometimes he'll do this thing where he just kind of looks up like this, and I'm, and I'm like, Angus, I have to have you to the side of the camera here because the eyes are what? He always says the windows to my soul and I say the windows to your soul. I don't know what's going on. And it's not that you, that person's going to be dead like this all the time. People take time to think. They look up. They look wherever. But a good actor is going to be trained enough to know that their focus is going to be to the left or the right of the camera and talking to the different characters that they place there. If there's five people in the scene Maybe they'll place three over here and a couple over here. It doesn't matter. Some casting directors want them, no matter if it's five characters, just keep looking this direction. I need to see what's going on. And sometimes you'll look down because you're having a hard moment, and then you'll come back up and recover from it, right? Um, cool. So my point is create an environment. If you tell them if, if it's your film and you really want those lines to be memorized, tell them. Please have the lines. Please have the sides memorized. And for the actors that come in and didn't have the sides memorized and you asked for the sides to be memorized, don't need them on my set. Don't need them on my set. Because you may have to memorize them that morning. 
because when we go when we go on regular you know big sets big big movie sets first thing they hand you while you're sitting in your makeup trailer is your sides for that day and you have to go through and you have to look and you have to go what's changed and if it's if it's changed which it invariably is you have to re-memorize it so you need an actor who can memorize quickly if they showed up with those two pages of script you gave them two lousy pages of script and they couldn't have that memorized that's gonna she says always good to share what is expected memorization improvisation off bookness etc these are all things that we expect and because i expect i know that i have to do that as an actor when i go that's exactly what i'm going to expect as a producer and a director and i know that the people that i go in for auditions expect that out of me they just do and here's the other thing about not being memorized you can't keep up those beat transitions in this exact same way that you could it's just about living in the moment i gotta disappear this is awesome thank you thank you so much for joining us i appreciate it um so now when you go to do the callbacks you know contact each person and uh tell them how wonderful it is i actually did this because i only had 20 people i was looking at for one particular role and i, I did audition other people as well for other roles but i did write I did because it's a small independent film and I know what it's like to be an actor. I actually did write emails to the people saying, you know, um, I'm going to the second round. I'm not going to bring you this time, but I so appreciate you coming and taking your time. Thank you so much so that they knew. Okay. Now that callback date, that callback date, I'm free to go work my regular job or I'm free to go to a different audition or I'm free to go work out or I can go to Paris. I don't care, but I release people so that they understand that. And then the, the people that I'm calling back now, if those people that I'm calling back are all of a sudden like, Ooh, I can't get off work that day. Really? Are you not going to be able to get off work that day for the day that I have a shoot and my location changes and I have to go to a different location on a different day? not my actor there <laughs> it's the smoking studio and is like because there's just too many variables for you and it's too expensive on a set you know even even with my piddly budget compared to major motion pictures it's just too much so this is this is something people have to understand you make PSAs good information oh thank you so much for stopping by here one thank you thank you um, so this is this is my point is that this like if you fall in love with an actor Kathy's like I'm with you if you fall in love with an actor and all of a sudden you're discovering ooh they kind of have this in the process in the in the audition process you all of a sudden discover oh I can't make that call that could I do a different time or they're the ones that that tell you they're gonna come at 10 but now all of a sudden they can't get off work until after 2 Again, you know, all those things are eliminators. No matter how brilliant you think they are, maybe you have to do another round of casting if you lost that person because they look like they're a flake. Or they're just not really, you know, in this to be a professional. Then because, because you guys, when it gets to your set, you, you can't afford any of that. So all of those things in the audition process for you are eliminators. I can't think of, um, and then when you go to offer them the role, you know, you know that you're going to, um, be excited about it, but again, I send a call that I send an email out to the people that were all in the callbacks and all of my guys Particularly I'm just using this example of this one cop role They're all sitting all those those resumes and photos are still sitting in my files because I thought they were all brilliant They were they were all amazing now the thing that I did do was I video, you know I had a camera in the room. I obviously even even the the improvisation I taped all of that because that helped me go back because I was working them with them to do a chemistry read at that point. A chemistry read is this, in case you don't know what a chemistry, went to CD workshops, but CDs care more about the honorarium than casting or recourse. Mm, that depends. That depends on the place that's hosting the workshop. That depends on the casting director. A lot of casting directors are really looking for new people. And I had a casting, I, I actually went to a workshop on Saturday. And in and it's for a very reputable, extremely well-known uh, casting workshop. And one of the things that she mentioned in that workshop was 
I, she goes, you, you can make all the web series you want. You can make all this. And th I don't believe in that. I think you should be making your own web series if you want. You can do whatever you want. But she said, I, I, we're never going to see it. We're just too busy. We're, this is never going to happen. The only way, the only effective way for you to walk in my office is to do something like this. Because I'm not bringing anybody into my office I don't personally know, that I haven't met, that I haven't seen their work, that I don't get a read on. And this is just like our audition process when we're auditioning our our, our independent films or our web series or whatever content it is that you're looking to cast, that audition process is a sussing out. That is a sussing out. You are reading how professional is this person? How talented is this person? How disciplined is this person? You're getting a read on all that because you have them in the room. It goes for those CD workshops as well. And you have to remember that. That's a lot of the reason that they do that. If this is not a perfect system. It's basically like paying to network. But my husband pays to network in his business as well, and he's not in this business at all. So you have to think of this as an investment. It's not the, this is not, it's a broken system. I grant you that. But remember that that, take, take a step back and be the casting director for a second. You can get fired on a project too. And it happens all the time. I've ended up going in on the same project with two different casting directors because the first casting director got fired on the project. Why does that happen? Their job is on the line as much as our job is on the line. Bonnie is saying it's no different than shopping. You're always refining your eye for what you might want to buy. That's exactly it. So those people, you know, and I will say that particular casting office has hired a shit load of actors that they've met out of those different workshops. I personally know who they are. Why is my brother not at rehearsal and not here? Because he should be rehearsing because he's getting experience. He's going to read the SMFA book anyway, and then he can, oh, he can just come to my YouTube channel and see this. I'm going to, I mount this on, like, if my name. If you go to YouTube and then um, put in my name, I have a playlist that's called the New Filmmakers Forums Tips, and he could, um, that's great. That's congratulations. He can come to the replay there. So you can always uh, tell him, and this is going to be replaying for 24 hours on this, this, you know, thing called Periscope. Okay. I think that's, you know, I don't want to go too long. I always go too long, so I want to be shorter tonight. Um, but anything else anybody wants to add to this particular subject matter? Does it, and Kathy, do you have anything you want to add? Or Bonnie, that you want to add about casting? That it really is a sussing out prod? It, you know, um, if I screw up badly during audition, what is the best way to get back in good graces? I will say this. I think every casting and every casting director I have ever met has always said this. Listen, we know everybody's going to suck at some point. They're going to be nervous and they are going to suck. What you could do is every good job you get after that, every job you get, you send them a postcard telling them that you're working because what's going to happen with that or what you're up to. And it has, to, you know, in some positive thing, not like, Hey, at the heard it's your birthday. Happy birthday. Trust that the buyers are looking for ingredients for recipes, even when it's the wrong fit. Yes. Well, why am I, I'm sitting with I'm sitting with a cabinet here of people that I thought were brilliant. Yes, and people have off days. We all understand that. But as long as I know that they keep um, working and, and I see that, then I'm going to bring them again and again. When do you hire a CD instead of doing it yourself? That's a really good question. Lisa Budwick, how nice to see you here. That is a really When do you hire a CD? Like, I'm... I'm trying to hire a CD for this next project I'm getting ready for because I'm going to need an entirely new cast for each shoot, this this series that I'm doing. It has to be an entirely new cast, and you do it as soon as you can afford it. That's Bonnie is saying, as soon as you can afford it. And so that's 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 my plan because I just it's going to be too many. I already know how many hats I'm going to be wearing. Uh, Kathy's saying when they have the relationships you don't have, that's key. Kathy's very right about that. What she means by when they have the relationships that you don't have is when you are looking for that um, next tier up, that actor that is that has a name and you want them attached to your project and they have that or, and Bonnie is saying same as wardrobe, makeup, anything else when you can't do it yourself DIY and you have to do have to have the money and you spend it absolutely it's worth it like for this next project I need actors who can do improv be dead real and I'm not not to diss UBC or anything but I've been in a lot of auditions with a lot of those actors um, for commercial work because I I get hired a lot because I improv and 
And, and if somebody is just trying to be funny all the time, as opposed to being real and in the moment, um, some directors never need to hire CDs, Bonnie says. I need to find actors that are that work in that same mindset that I work in. So I happen to know that she's already hired an entire cast season from another show called I Love You But I Lied that she found brilliant actors like this, that are actors that are, that are trained actors that also do improv. She says others would prefer not to be bothered with the process and hire out for that job. Right. And those directors, Kathy is saying, because they already have those built-in relationships, they can just call up their favorite actors and say, hey, do you want to be in this? And I'm certainly going to do the same thing. Like, I've met a lot of actors, by the way. Um, do I agree postcards are a waste? Um, Kathy Carey, no, because they don't mind doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, some here, it depends. Every director is different. Some directors are, are actors' directors, so they surround themselves with actors all the time, actors that they love. Um, who's that other guy that's doing scope right now that he just did a great scope on, um, on, um, the different, uh, uh, who is he, Bonnie, that, that he, he talked forever to everybody that had comments. So it, it took a long time to get to the point, but he talked about the fact that <laughs> not Eric Appel, <laughs> no, but Eric Appel is, is really great to follow. It's a different guy um, that was talking about the fact that he like hangs out with his actors. He becomes friends with his actors because he get he gets a better rapport with them, and and that's very important. And then he can just call them when he wants them on a project. Just like I'm going to call a lot of my friends for um, projects that I know they're right for. And some actors get weird about it because they're like, "Well, why didn't you call me?" And I want to go, "Well, just because you just weren't right for that role, it doesn't mean I'm not going to use you down the line. You just have to be right for the role." Which this is the best thing about being a uh, actor who's also a producer and a writer is you really start to understand the fact that I'm not right for every role. I'm not right. She says other directors would rather study uh, sound, you know, SFX work on post than be friendly with actors. It's a personality thing. Absolutely. There are a lot of, and you know what? Some act, that's why I wanted to mention before that I didn't get back to, like some directors are cold when you walk in the room or reads as they're being cold. But the truth of the matter is they just may not be really great with actors. Like they're really brilliant at at setting up a shot. They're really brilliant working with a cinematographer. They have a technical end thing going on. But the reason they may be cold is that they just, it's not personal. Yeah, they, they just aren't, that's not their favorite part of the process. They may be introvert. They may not be like me where I'm like, here's some cookies, read my lines. <laughs> How small of a project could I send postcards out for notifications to CDs? Student film? Yeah, if you do a student film like um, or, or a webisode, absolutely. That's work, man. You know, somebody cared enough to hire you. Somebody thought you were right for the role and they hired you and you're doing the work. Th yes, absolutely. Somebody's saying show Bible and case by case person. Not everybody wants them. Some people prefer to have emails because you've met them in the workshop and they'll give you a specific email that they want updates sent to. Some like postcards and others say, if I get a postcard, it's going in the trash. That's why it's important to start building those relationships with those specific casting directors that you know cast your brand, your type, your bullseye. Read the Self-Management for Actors book. You'll know what I'm talking about. And um, good night. Mr. Bananelli, and I look forward to hearing you from Remy Brother. Um, and then you'll start to understand who, you know, just blindly sending out postcards doesn't matter. Okay, I'm going to get to my funny story. Here's my funny story. When I first moved to New York, and I was an inexperienced young thing, <laughs> I thought that the best way, this is so not SMFA, I thought that the best way to get on casting directors... <laughs> I have two horror stories for tonight. Are you ready? One involves Cameron McIntosh, personally. Okay, so <laughs> I thought the best way to get seen by all of um, the casting directors in town was just to just go to every EPA, okay? Every Broadway audition, that equity principal auditions in New York City, where you have to get up, you have to get online at like 5 a.m., freeze your ass off. I have a little chair that I would sit on. I'd have my little... <laughs> His little coffee, she asked for EPA, right? Because I was new to town. I was like, God damn it. I'm going to have every single one of those casting directors is going to know who I am before the year is out. I went to, are you, are you ready? Wait for it. Wait for it. I went to 111 EPAs in one year. 
Okay. You want to talk about spinning your wheels, wasting your time oh, to be young and stupid. Anyway, so I decided that was going to be the way the casting directors were really going to know who I was. Now, this is tragic. <laughs> this is tragic. But I showed I got hired to do Dirty Blonde that way. And I had I had a third callback in Mel Brooks um, for the producers that way. I also, so I'm not saying everything was negative because some of those out of 111, some I'm actually going to be right for, right? Because it's a numbers game. <laughs> so I, I actually got jobs out of this. It doesn't work. It's just such a time suck. Well, but if I would have just gone, if I, oh, 83 paid workshops in 60 days. But Kyle, were they casting directors? I'm just going to ask. I think that's wonderful. But were they casting? Have you read SMFA? in self-management for actors, because you may be pulling one of my stunts here, unbeknownst to you, you may not be targeting the right casting directors. You could be wasting money. Read self-management for actors and understand who you should be targeting, who are the ones to get in front of and who you're just wasting your money going to see because they are not, they're never going to cast you, your type, your brand, your bullseye. That's something that's really important to understand. Okay. So this is when I didn't understand it. I showed up to, yes, wait for it, the Lion King audition. Can you feel the love tonight? <laughs> and the, can you imagine what the hell those casting directors, I mean, I'm surprised I'm not blackballed from New York City at this point. Yes, yes, I did kill it. I killed Lion King. I'm going to hold... Can you feel the love tonight? La, 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 la. <laughs> so, long and the short of this is, the casting director, thank God, at the time, not Pippin or the Wiz. Well, they weren't playing. If Pippin and the Wiz were having EPAs, I would have been there. Okay, they actually, when I walked to the room, just like, literally, like, bent over were like, what are you doing here? And I was like, I figured very few people would be here today. You would, you were sitting here anyway. Why not? And they were actually had a sense of humor about it. Okay. That did not get me a job. It just wasted my time. Luckily they had a sense of humor because most casting directors will not have a sense of humor for that. Because like, what if I had taken up a spot? Like what if all the spots, like over 120 people showed up that day because an APA is to see 120 people in a day. So what if I had taken a person of color spot for that. Wouldn't I be pissed as a casting director? What the hell is this white woman doing here? You know, luckily it was a light day. They had plenty of time, right? So it wasn't, that's why they were okay with it. But if I had taken up a real person slot, you know, that's just uncool. I mean, you just don't get any more uncool than what I was. Okay. Second audition story, horror story. Okay. Because I'm from the Midwest, I don't know how to dress. And I had, she said, except they often cast so much by the time they get to the EPAs. No, see, the thing, EPAs are required, okay? They're required. They actually have to do them. Sometimes they're really looking for people, but a lot of times it's just a requirement that they do those auditions, so you need to understand that. That said, I got hired, real jobs, callbacks, callbacks to Broadway shows, and they've cast so much before there's EPAs. At, well, yeah, because the EPAs usually, well, technically, legally, they're not supposed to have the auditions before they hold those uh, EPAs <clears throat> for, I mean, the real auditions, like the agent submitted actual auditions. They're supposed to do the EPAs first. That's technically how it's supposed to work. I'm actually an alternate to the EPA committee. That's the legal realm, but it does not happen that way. And we are very aware of that at equity, that it does not happen that way. So that's when I learned and stopped going to EPAs because I like I got on the committee and I was like, oh, this is just, this is a, these things are already cast. So I'm just wasting my time. But I still thought it was valuable because I thought I was meeting casting directors. I was just wasting my time. I really was wasting my time. However, okay, there was one EPA I go to. I don't even remember what it was for, but Cameron McIntosh was in the room. And for whatever reason, they were actually looking and he was actually there. I'm from Minnesota and I'm wearing a button down jean dress. Okay. Snap buttons all the way down. And I sing, which is an on brand song for myself at the time. Cause I was younger, cuter. 
I sang Everybody's Girl from Steel Pier. Okay? And if you know this particular number, at one point it says, <laughs> if you, yeah, right? First of all, I'm styling and I'm so right for this piece, right? And I sing, if you got it, why not spread it? And I do this and my jean dress goes all the way up. I spread my jean dress open for Cameron McIntosh. Oh yeah, baby. Oh, I did. Yes, I did. Class. Class. All class. This is, okay, first of all, their eyes were just like, Holy shit. I mean, they literally thought some freak had walked in their room and I was like trying to do some pole dance, some kind of like, you know, whatever. And the, and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Okay. No, no, no. I'm just going, no, no, no. It wasn't. <laughs> and the accompanist was such a bitch that he actually took my, my big, you know, three ring binder and went boom and closed it and like did this and had it held out for me to take and just leave while all the while I'm going, this was not a choice. It was not a choice. I'm like going, it's not a, it was not a choice. That wasn't, that wasn't, and, and it just didn't matter. I needed to get the hell out of the room because they were getting ready to call the cops. You know, I have not been cast in a Cameron McIntosh show. However, my good friend, Jeremy Stoll, is the um he's in the show so i end up there backstage all the time and i just smile and smile <laughs> he designed my website for the acting academy <laughs> so that's these are my two horror stories of why you need to be careful epas are dangerous that's my that's the <laughs> some from there for the memoir for the memoirs yeah it's a pretty awesome story so with that, everybody, <laughs> don't do what I do. That's that's the lesson. That's the lesson. Listen to the old lady and don't don't wear a jean dress. Jean dresses are are dangerous. <laughs> Button up jean dresses. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they've been telling that story for years. I mean, I've told Jeremy if he's seen, you know. Cameron McIntosh. But he's just going to think Jeremy's nuts then for knowing somebody that would have. I just, I can't. But now everybody on Periscope knows. How do you like that? How do you like them apples? Okay, so you guys, thank you. This has been a lot of fun. I feel like I've had therapy. I don't know about you. Quick question. Better to have a bad agent than no agent, or does it change per situation? Well, it depends on what you categorize as a bad. Yeah, what's your horror story? Yeah, I, I got it. Um, is it better to have a bad agent or no agent? Well, if by bad agent you mean, and Bonnie has addressed this on several occasions, if you mean, in fact, Bonnie, do you have like the link or where they could look for the answer to this question? Because she's been addressing this question with some people actually right now that are getting ready to fire their agent or fire their representation. Um, it's going to depend on your situation. Um, and you have to know what do you, what, what do you mean by bad agent? You know, do they not, Bonnie says, what if I'm blacklisted? Is that, is that a legit question? What if you're blacklisted? Oh, I'm blacklisted right now somehow from the email list. I got, I got myself locked out tonight. <laughs> I called Keith. She said, I, I think you think it's a bad agent. It's better to have no agent. If the agent isn't doing anything for you, if the agent isn't doing anything for you, like they're not getting you out, oh, you're asking the question he was asking. Oh, yeah. Um, Yes, you need a hell yes agent. Thank you. You need a hell yes agent. An agent that understands you, an agent that gets you. And then you also have to do a little self-analysis on that too. Like, um, yes, go there, thank you. Google hell yes agent at Bonnie Gillespie and she has a whole wonderful article about this. Okay, you're gonna, and I believe there's even videos. If your agent is not a hell yes, there's a better, better option. Listen, if something's going rotten and you're feeling it like that, then something is rotten. Just go find, go find another agent to work with. But you should have the conversation with the agent first. You know, I believe like, you know, calling them, having lunch or coffee or whatever, and just, you know, our an office meeting. She said, if you're not making him money, he knows it too, you know, he's not going to be sad you're leaving. So if you guys are not like, if you're not, if you're booking nothing, if nothing is happening and he's, and that agent he or she is not sending you out, that's when you have, go to have the talk with your agent, there'll probably be a mutual, um, 
satisfactory answer that this isn't working, you know? Because you can always go out there and either find your own work by answering the audition notices yourself and ask Actors Access, Casting Frontier, all those different places that have them. Um, you can always work on that yourself in the meantime or create your own work until you can find that hell yes representation. So go read Bonnie's um, articles about it. And uh, I think I think you'll you'll find the answer to that question. And for the rest of uh, everybody that was asking the other questions about tear jumping and moving up and everything, also her book, God dang it, why don't I have it like sitting, I've got all this screenwriting book right now because I'm in the screenwriting, um, uh, doing my screenwriting stuff. Um, so, Self-Management for Actors, great book for people to understand um, if, if you're an actor from the acting perspective, but it also makes a difference from the, um, from the uh, producer side, from the, this side as well. So I've had a great time tonight. Bonnie, thank you so much for coming. Kathy, thank you so much for coming. Everybody follow them that is not following them. You, you will get more pearls of wisdom and less <laughs> nightmare stories. Thank you both so much for this. Sorry to take up so much time. No, you have a lot to chew on. Listen, listen. No, you're awesome. No, oh, thank you. And you're awesome. You guys are awesome. And if here's the thing, you're very welcome, Rebelise. Nice to see you, my dear. You have a nice picture. And Kathy, thank you guys so much for uh, stopping by of the stories. I'm going to do, I should do one story a night. I should do one. Believe it or not, I have more. This is sad. Okay, so I'll see you guys later. It was so much fun tonight. Sleep well, everybody. Bye-bye.